morning. Thank you for being here this morning. Um, got a lot on my mind today. Been doing a lot of reflecting. If you are a grandmother and you have, particularly if you have a grandson, small grandsons, you may be particularly interested this morning, at least I hope you will. One of the most, I won't say one of the most, the most influential person in my whole life was my grandmother, Hilda Long. She was my mother's mother. Grandma was born in 1890. 1890, she um, had my mother and my uncle by the time she was 25, which would have been around 1915, and somewhere along at that time frame, her husband, who was my grandfather, was murdered. Murdered. So here was my grandmother, 25 years old, two small children in the middle of the South Carolina low country swamp, a widow with two kids at the beginning of World War I. We look at some of our problems and we wonder, what am I going to do? How am I going to face this issue that I'm presented with? Well, what my grandmother chose to do was to go to college. She decided to go to Columbia, South Carolina, and she pursued a degree so that she could become a teacher. Grandma taught school for many, many years in a one-room schoolhouse. So I've seen pictures that look like Little House on the Prairie. You had big, robust boards with overalls and little bitty guys, all in the same class, girls and boys of all ages. Not only did she teach school, but she taught Sunday school as well. She belonged to a little church called Nixville Baptist Church in Nixville, South Carolina. Many years later, when I was a child, I remember seeing a, a classroom called the Hilda Long Class. Well, what does that have to do with me? And what does that have to do with today's message? It has everything to do with me. And I hope it has a lot to do with the message as well. In 1947, Grandma came to live with my mom and dad. My brother Danny was born, and Mama needed help with the baby, so Grandma left South Carolina and came to Jacksonville to live with my mom and dad. She never went back. I was born in 1952, and Grandma at that point was 62. Her birthday was five days, before, four days before mine, December 5th and December 9th. So when I was born on December the 9th, she was already 62 years old. Well, think about this. My mom and dad both worked, which was unusual at the time, but Grandma was a constant. We had a built-in public school teacher. We had a built-in Sunday school teacher and a built-in mother. I was homeschooled before homeschool was popular. From birth through the time I started first grade, Grandma homeschooled me. Not only that, she taught me Bible stories. Not only that, I saw Jesus in the life of my grandmother before I ever heard the name. In her actions, in her manner, in her unselfishness, in her servanthood, she modeled the Lord that she read about. Grandma was a, a master storyteller. When, when I was real young, Quite often, and maybe for a long, long time, I slept with Grandma because there was only so much room in the house. And I can remember her combing that old long yellow hair at night, and then we'd crawl up in the bed, 
big old iron bed, and she would tell me stories. And Betty, she could tell the stories. When she told about Moses in the bulrushes, you could see the pitch on the basket. You could smell the stagnant water. You could see the cattails waving in the breeze. You could see Pharaoh's daughter right up the creek. She made these stories so real. When she talked about Joseph and his coat of many colors, I'm a little colorblind, but when Grandma told the story, I saw the colors vividly, vividly, because they were so important to her. Grandma told a story about a, a little boy in a rock in a sling. She said later on that this man would be known as a man after God's own heart. She told these stories with a passion because she had a passion. She had a passion for this word. She had a passion for the God of this word and for the Jesus of this word. Folks, it's not, the Bible is important, but if we don't meet the one that the Bible points us to, we're missing the whole point. Whole point. From cover to cover, the Bible points us to God and appoints us to Jesus. One of the things that Grandma wanted me to learn was that there is no education without application. Greg, you talked about education one day. All of the stuff that you have taught yourself, all of the stuff that you have learned since the old days of the machinist work, if you hadn't applied it, each time you learned it, you would be right back where you were all those years ago. There would have been no improvement. There would have been no education. There would be no 3D machine company. But you have applied the things that you've learned, so therefore, you have been wonderfully educated. I talked with a lady one time who had... Um, been in education for 40 years. Sadly enough, one of our peers said she had one year experience 40 times. That's not education. Education is when we learn something, when we apply it to our lives, and we see a change. That's the whole point of education. That goes for spiritual education as well, folks. When we read a Bible story, when we study a text, when we hear a sermon, we should every time say, how can I apply that to my life? My grandmother was 62 when I was born. And you would think, well, my goodness, she was in the, she was round in third then. Not hardly. We buried Grandma when I was 40 years old. She was five months away from being 102 years old. For 40 years, I had the privilege of being exposed to this godly woman. Can grandmothers make a difference in a little boy's life? Folks, I'm almost 62. I'm almost the same age that my grandmother was the day I was born. Only eternity will reveal the impact that she had on my life and on the many other lives that she touched. Don't ever underestimate the influence that you as a grandmother can have or you as a human being can have because there's no limit. 22 years ago, when I was 40, in July of 1992, we buried my grandmother. Sometime later, I wish I had done it sooner, I wrote a poem. And I'd like to share with you today that poem. Keep in mind, I was just a kid, I was 40. My grandma died the other day. There are some things I have to say 
because she touched me in a special way. Since 1890, she has lived in a quiet and humble way. She put Christ first and herself last. She pressed on like Paul and forgot the past. She went for the mark that lay ahead. She lived for him, but now she's dead. Widowed at 25, she had to raise two small children without any praise. On she worked with her head held high, always focusing on the sky. The road was rough, surely not paved. One goal she had, the children to save. Grandma taught school and she loved the church. On Sundays to Nixville she would march to worship the Lord in all his glory. She put him first. She loved his story. In the 40s, she came to live in my home to live with my parents before I was born. In the 50s, I came without any name. I was given her husband's to carry the flame. I was given her husband's to carry the flame. She taught me to read and she taught me to write. She taught me strength without having to fight. Somehow I knew that Grandma was right. I'm now 40 and she is gone to be with the Lord in a brand new home. She's no longer deaf. She's no longer blind. She's left all pain and suffering behind. She's singing the praises and hearing the story of Jesus' love and Jesus' glory. She's with my granddad and my mama too. And I'm sure that she's happy and feeling brand new. Yes, Grandma died the other day. These were some things I had to say, for she touched me in a special way. Some say that death is an un unhappy ending, but for my Grandma, it was just the beginning. For now the praises she does sing, and I ask, O oh, death, where is thy sting? I suppose that I should be blue, but all I can say is, Grandma, Thank you. One of the stories that Grandma told was about a little shepherd boy, like I said, who became known as a man after God's own heart. There was a problem in Israel. There was an overgrown bully of a Philistine who came out every day and taunted the army of Israel. Grandma shared the story and she said that there were applications that if we can't apply it, there's no point in fooling with it. But she said, honey, there's applications in the story that can be used for any giant that you ever face. We're going to be looking this morning in 1 Samuel 17 to see how a young shepherd boy named David went about facing his giant and see if we can get an application for us today. Will you pray? Pray with me this morning. Lord, I thank you so much for this time. I thank you, Lord, for the godly influence of my grandmother. I thank you for this church. I thank you for the privilege of standing in your holy spot this morning. Lord, I don't take it for granted. And Lord, I just ask that you open the ears of the people here, that you close my mouth and open yours. And Lord, I just ask that people's lives will be touched with your message today. Lord, I just ask that giants will be brought down, that victory will be given to you, and everybody will know that there is a God in Israel. If you will, turn to 1 Samuel chapter 17, and we're going to begin in verse 2. The Saul and the men of Israel gathered together, and they encamped in the valley of Elah, and drew up in battle array against the Philistines. The Philistines stood on a mountain on one side, Israel stood on a mountain on the other, with a valley between them. And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines called Goliath from Gath, 
whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was five thousand shekels of bronze. And he had bronze armor on his legs, and a bronze javelin between his shoulders. Now the staff of a spear was like a weaver's beam, and his iron spearhead weighed six hundred shekels, and a shield-bearer went before him. There he stood and cried out to the armies of Israel and said to them, Why have you come to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and you the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves, and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistines, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. They were dismayed and greatly afraid. Remember that. Now David was the son of the Epaphrite of Egypt, Epaphrathite of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse, and who had eight sons. And the man was old, advanced in years in the days of Saul. The three oldest sons of Jesse had gone to follow son to, to the battle. Okay, ba ba ba. Okay, David. All right. David was the youngest, and the three oldest followed Saul. But David occasionally went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. The Philistine drew near and presented himself forty days, morning and evening. Then Jesse said to his son David, Take now for your brothers an ephah of this dried grain and these ten loaves, and run to your brothers at the camp. Carry these ten cheeses, blah, blah, blah. That is way too much um, scripture. So we're going to stop there. All right, here's the bottom line. The men were there for battle. One team up here, one team up there, valley below. Every day, the Philistine, Goliath, would come out and taunt the army of Israel. He would blaspheme God, challenge the Israelites, and every day, they would run. Every day. It says they were scared, they were frightened. Well, Jesse had several boys. The older ones were fighting. David was the young one. He was keeping the sheep at home. His dad said, go take some stuff to the battle, take some cheese, take some bread, give me some news of the war, and come back and give me a report. David shows up, and everybody's talking, and while he's there, he sees this hulk of a man come out and make this proclamation. And he sees the fear on these people's face. David says, what will, what will happen? What will happen to the fellow? In verse 26, David spoke to the man who stood by him saying, what shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? Does that sound like a voice of fear? David said, what happens? What does the guy get that kicks out giants, accepts his challenge? What will happen to him? What will he receive? The guy who removes this reproach from Israel. Then the classic line, Who, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that thinks he can defy the armies of the living God? Not a living God, but the living God. Who does this guy think he is that thinks he can come down here and, and make fun of the God of creation? Basically, he's saying, guys, you may be scared, but I'm not. You know, in the book of Timothy, Paul tells Timothy, 
that God has not given us a spirit of timidity or fear. In that same area, Paul says, I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed against that day. This same theme was going through David's head. He wasn't saying, I'm big enough to kick his tail. He was saying, this guy is blaspheming my God, the God of Israel, the God of creation, the God of Abraham, the God of Moses, the God of all that have come before us. And who does he think he is? I will fight him. And folks, there's got to be some application. You may be here this morning and you may be saying, wow, but you don't understand. You don't understand what I'm facing. You, you can't get an idea of what I'm up against. 1915, my grandma was up against a, a giant. She was a widow. It was World War I. Within us, there's a, a thing the psychologists call the fight or flight syndrome. If somebody slaps you upside the head, you got two choices. You can fight or you can run. David was not a runner. Grandma Long was not a runner. She dug in. She stood her ground. Not in her own strength, but in the strength of the God that she believed in, she pressed on. David said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that thinks he can taunt the armies of the living God? When we face a giant in our life, we've got to be bold. We've got to be bold, not in our own strength, but in the power and the strength of God. Well, Saul, King Saul, he hears about all this. He says, man, you mean there's one guy in Israel that's not chicken? Bring him in. Bring him in. So he brings him in. In verse 33, 31. Now when the words which David spoke were heard, they reported them to Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight this Philistine. David says, Relax, I'm your man. I will fight this guy. And Saul is thinking, Son, I appreciate your spirit. I appreciate your spunk. But you're just a kid. He eats boys like you for breakfast. Saul said to David, You're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are a youth, and he is a man of war from his youth. The second point of our application this morning is that David looked back. He said, King, let me tell you a couple things. He said, I was keeping my father's sheep back when, and a bear came. And he said, I killed that bear because he was trying to mess with my dad's sheep. Another time, a lion came to devour the sheep and I killed the lion. Not in my own strength, not in my own power, but he said, the same God who delivered me from the mouth of the lion and the bear will deliver me from this uncircumcised Philistine. I know that he will. I know that he can. And I'm willing to fight him. Again, whatever giant you're facing today, whatever wall that's in front of you, perhaps it's cancer, perhaps it's the death of a loved one, perhaps you've lost your mate, a child, financial, maybe you and your wife not getting along. I don't know what it is, but I know this. You gotta be bold. You can't be a wuss. You gotta be man up. Then you gotta look back. In a few more days, Ramon and I will celebrate our 41st 
wedding anniversary. We were 20 years old. We were married and we were students in college. Now, if I were to tell you that we've lived 41 years and never had a crossword, that would be a lie. If I were to tell you we'd never had a fight or never called each other names, that would be a humdinger of a tale. But I can stand before you today because we will both tell you that we can look back and remember that time when God delivered us from the lion and he delivered us from the bear and that same God we will depend on when it's time to fight again. We will stand firm in our faith knowing that Jehovah God the God of David, the God of Abraham, the God of Moses will deliver us from whatever comes our way. you got to apply it, folks. It's more than just a story. you got to be bold. you got to look back. After we show our confidence in God and after we look back ultimately we have to fight ultimately we have to go toe to toe that is when we have to let go and let God let's look in verse 38 so, Paul, so Saul clothed David with his armor and he put a bronze helmet on his head. He also clothed him with a coat of mail. David fastened a sword to his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested him. And David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these. I'm not testing them. David says, this isn't my style, King. You know, I appreciate it, but I've got to use the tools that God has naturally given me. I, I don't wear all this stuff. So in verse 40, it says, Then he took his staff in his hand, and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook, put them in a shepherd's bag in a pouch which he had, and his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. So the Philistine came and began drawing near to David, and the men who bore the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth, ruddy and good-looking. Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beast of the field. He says, Are you kidding me? Are you the best they got? You're sending me a punk kid with a stick to fight me? A fighting machine? Boy, I eat kids like you for breakfast. What are you people thinking? Oh. He says, this day, I'll feed you to the buzzards. Whew. Look at David's reply. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. I come to you in the name of God. That name that is above every name. That name that one day everybody will bow to. I don't care how big you are. I don't care how strong you are. I don't care how big of a giant you're facing. If you come to that giant in the name of God of Israel, victory will be yours. He says, this day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you, I will take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth. Now get this that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Notice he didn't say, 
I'm going to kill you so everybody will say I'm all that. It ain't about David. It's about God using David. Today it's not about me. It's about God using me to proclaim about this same name, the same God of Israel. That if we're bold, that if we'll look back and see his deliverance, that if we'll let go and give it to him, victory will be ours. Those are the applications. Those, that is the life lesson that got my grandmother through almost 102 years. Folks, she never remarried. She lived all those years serving other people. She raised her children. She raised nieces and nephews. In her 60s, she came and raised my brother and I, taught us Bible stories, taught us how to read, taught us how to write, taught us how to communicate, and taught us how to love the Lord. She did it in that name, that precious name that she so richly believed in. And because of her, I stand here today proclaiming that same God. David said, by the time today is over, you will be dead. I will have your head in my hand. Philistines will flee and the world will know that there is a God in Israel. Then all the assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Whatever battle you're in, folks, it is the Lord's. It is the Lord's battle, and he can win it if you will trust him and if you will let go and let God and give him the glory. So it was, when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, that David heard and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. Then David put his hand in his bag, took out a stone, and he slung it, struck the Philistine in his forehead, so that the stone sank into his forehead, and he fell on his face to the earth. David knocked him down with a rock. Didn't even have a sword, just a sling and a few pebbles. Walked over picked up the giant's own sword and cut his head off. Verse 50. David prevailed over the Philistine in 31. Therefore David ran, stood over the Philistine, took his sword, drew it out of his sheath, killed him, cut off his head. When the Philistine saw that their champion was dead, they fled. End of story. Folks, I don't know what you're dealing with. I don't know what your Goliath is today. We all have them. If you don't have one today, hang on. But you'll have one tomorrow. You may have one next week. That's the way life is. We'll go through valleys. We'll go through mountaintops. We come to church to practice. So when game day comes, we'll be prepared. If we're not applying it, we're not learning it. If we're not learning it and applying it, we're not using it, we might as well be burning daylight, John Wayne would say, wasting time. We have got to apply what we've learned, and you've got to believe it with all your heart. Maybe you're here this morning and don't have a clue. In order for you to trust the Lord, you've got to know Him. He has made a way for you to know Him. The same God of David loved us so much that he sent his son to die on the cross that we might have a relationship with him through the blood of Jesus. If you've never experienced that, maybe today the Lord is knocking on your door. If you want to talk to somebody about that, there'll be men here at the front when I get through. Folks, the bulrushes were real. The cattails were real. The pitch from Moses' basket was real. The giant was real. The sling was real. David was real. Noah was real. Parting of the Red Sea was real. All those children's stories were real. Not just some fiction. 
But if we don't apply them to our lives, we're missing the joy of the Lord. Let me encourage you to come today. Come to this Jesus. Come to this God who will never leave you nor forsake you. And Grandma, don't ever give up on that little boy. Don't ever underestimate the influence that you have on him. Poor the little girl. I'm not a girl, so I don't know about that. Who knows? When you're dead and gone, and he's 62 years old, he may be standing, proclaiming the very things that you taught him as a child. Let's pray.